The biggest risks of flying with the ATA was the fact that pilots were flying an aircraft they'd never flown before from the many diverse types of aircraft there were. ATA, you had to make your own decisions. In the Air Force, you never made the decision whether or not you were going to fly. You were told, you fly today. Everything sort of comes by stages, and we were the pioneers of, of women flying, I suppose. During the Second World War, the vital task of supplying aircraft to the Air Force and the Royal Navy fell to the civilian men and women pilots of the Air Transport Auxiliary. By early 1944, aircraft were being moved from the factories to bases at a rate of 2,400 a month. In preparation for the planned invasion of Europe, number one ferry pool at White Waltham near Reading and number nine at Aston Down near Stroud were designated as invasion ferry pools providing support to squadrons preparing for D-Day. Don Hoare and Eric Viles were both stationed at Aston Down. Even though much has changed in the intervening years, a visit to the airfield brings back vivid memories. I always describe the number nine vehicle at Aston Down as being a drab hut on a West Country airfield, miles away from anywhere. And that's basically what it was. Well, this brings back a few memories, doesn't it, of the old yeah. airfield? Yeah, it was 60 years ago when we first came here. And you remember when they had all the squadrons here preparing for, for D-Day and they'd for mass formations. That's right, yeah. And they, they were all... Typhoons, yeah, Tempests, yeah, lot. you name it, a lot. And the Lancasters coming across from the MU. Eric and Don's friendship, like many forged during the war, has stood the test of time. Checks complete, yes. All set to go? Yes. I flew with Don on several occasions, probably eight or nine times, and we got on exceptionally well. He would tell you that uh, when he first knew me, he called me Sir, because he was an air cadet, and I was commissioned. Exactly the same way as when I first met Myra, she called me Sir, but that didn't last long. <laughs> One of the uh, jobs I used to do when, when we were flying was to fly on the taxi Anson. So my job was to sit alongside the captain of the Anson and wind up the wheels. It was 112 turns, and that took some doing, I can assure you, because by the time we got the wheels up, it was time to wind them back down again. And I often used to wonder, was it worth the effort? But I'm assured it was. It saved a lot of fuel. My goodness me. There's the old air road shelter. Yes, over there. I remember? Could, and no, then indeed. the hangar was the other side of those trees. Yes, where we used to keep the Ansons. That's right. And yeah. look at the poor old MT shed. Look at the oh, state dear, oh dear. Let's have a look inside, see if there's anything left. Oh. <coughs> Goodness gracious me. I wonder whose kit this is. Yeah, I remember the split level. Do you remember... They used to have the cars up there That's and, right. and the towing vehicles down here yeah. in this section. Yeah. I still have to ring Bill Curry when I get back home and tell him we've been back to his old domain. <laughs> yeah. He still left, left a few papers behind. <laughs> I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Right. Preparations for the D-Day invasion of Europe accelerated throughout the spring of 1944. They were meant to be secret, although everyone sensed that something big was about to happen. From the air, however, it was obvious to the ATA pilots at Hamble Ferry Pool that something was going on. The south of England became a large aircraft carrier. All the aircraft were brought down from East Anglia and the north to do the invasion. So every air dome was solid. No one was allowed into that coastal strip within about 10 miles of the south coast. But from the air, of course, one could see everything. You could see the build-up. The army vehicles were stacked up tanks and carriers right back in the New Forest, almost to Winchester. Uh, the landing craft were massed in the channel. You could have walked across them to the Isle of Wight. We used to hear the little boats, the LCTs and the LCIs, going down for a practice. And they'd go pop, 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 had these sort of engines, and they'd go down for about a quarter of an hour, and quarter of an hour, they'd be back again. 
And we had this even this one evening, we were all sitting down eating, and we heard pop, 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 pop. And then we heard endless pop, 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 pops, just, just endless. And we all got up and said, my goodness, it's the invasion. And then one morning we woke up and there was nothing in the river. And there was, and I had to ferry a bit far somewhere. And I flew off and there was nothing. All the trees were empty of people and tanks. And that was very moving, you know, to think of them all going over there and what was happening. Dead silence everywhere. On June the 6th, 1944, D-Day landings began as the troops, landing craft and planes that the Hamble pilots had seen from the air forged a bridgehead on the Normandy coast. Six months later, the ATA returned to Europe when two hurricanes were ferried to an airfield near Dieppe from Aston Down. The first ATA pilots, of course, to, fl to fly back into France was Hugh Berger, the commanding officer, and Maurice Arley, the French pilot who was based with us. Within a few weeks, the ATA commenced regular ferrying flights to Europe. As well as carrying out their traditional role of ferrying fighters and bombers to frontline squadrons, some pilots joined the Air Movement's flight section, taking on the task of moving people, injured soldiers and supplies all over the continent. I did uh, quite a number of flights when it was full of all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> it was loaded to the gun op very often that I had to go in through the emergency exit into the cockpit from the outside <laughs> and then they shut things down after I got in. <laughs> Some pilots like Johnny Jordan were recruited for special missions including transporting high-ranking German officers back to Britain for interrogation. Well, the people we were collecting were nearly all generals. Most of them were uh, German Army or German Air Force. There was a chap called Vic Dries who I had with me who was, I used to call him my navigator, but he was completely useless as a navigator, but he was jolly good at telling them where to get off and that sort of, sort of controlling these people. Johnny also rescued people from the countries the Nazis had occupied, landing on roads if there wasn't a nearby airstrip. The only name I remember is this General Bor Komarovsky, and uh, he had uh, two people under him who we brought back, and uh, they were got out of the concentration camp, and we had to pick them up at a certain time because they, they, it was all timed uh, that they would be at this airfield at a certain time. And apparently he saved their lives because um, they... Uh, Wallace pleaded with him, he said, can, can you take us out of the country and so on? He said, and you know what Johnny's like? He said, yeah, all right, boy, get in. <laughs> but it wasn't only generals and vital supplies that the ATA pilots brought back from the continent. Oh, I was very naughty on one occasion. I didn't take my parachute. I filled the parachute with bicycle tyres and with coffee. And uh, with that, I flogged them in the black market. And then I bought myself an Omega watch, which was one of the last that I could trace in, uh, in Brussels. And uh, so that, that was my reward for that. <laughs> but I mean, oh, Johnny brought a, a motorbike back from a BMW motorbike <laughs> in, in an Anson. A, a motorbike sidecar, I think it was, originally, but it, we took the sidecar off. Marvellous motorbike. and. I always remember being very pleased with that and using it for several years afterwards, too. By the spring of 1945, the Allies had crossed into Germany and on the 7th of May, the Nazis signed an unconditional surrender. The war in Europe was over. The following day was declared VE Day and hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets to celebrate the end of the war. Well, when peace was declared, I had to take a mosquito from the south to Aldergrove in Ireland. But I didn't know of peace. That was the day that the one o'clock news said we were now at peace. Well, I took off just before that. As soon as I landed, there were oh, dozens of, all the engineers were there. And the first one picked me up and whizzed me around. And then the other one picked me up and whizzed me around. And I said, just a minute, I'm gonna be sick. What's happening? Why are you visiting me around? Peace has been declared. You can take that mosquito back. We don't want it. I was just terribly relieved. Who wasn't that it was 
that it was, you know, over because the Japanese thing was still going on. Um, and the work began to um, slow down, of course. Um, but you could hardly wish the war to go on, could you, so that we could have lots of work. Well, I was very wicked, really. I could have wished the war had gone on longer because I was enjoying myself so much and I knew that I was doing a job and flying aircraft that I, I'd never fly again. And I came back to Gloucestershire and I felt really devastated, a great hollow, you know. I thought, what now? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Nothing will ever really live up to those wartime experiences. <laughs> 